Good evening again. Welcome for the third part of One Man's Faith. And we're looking at Revelation in a little different glance. Uh, I have no intentions of going deep into the uh, the bowls and the seals and because I don't think we're going to be here for that anyway, number one. Number two, that's not the point of Revelation. That's not the point of Revelation. And we're looking at it as showing the covenant, the marriage covenant being fulfilled and we're going to a wedding and we're going to be in the wedding or we're going to be watching the wedding depending on whether we have Jesus in our heart or not. So we were looking, uh, the last scripture I, I, I quoted was from Jeremiah 2. I think it's interesting because I was talking about the fact that once you are betrothed, once the covenant has been signed, once all seven seals are there, then the bride and the groom are considered married. And look what, look what God says here. He says, he says, why do my people say we are free to roam? We will no longer come to you. You see, that's like me being engaged to my wife and going out with Sally and saying, you know, I'm just going to consider doing this. I've got, you know, I'm engaged to her, but I'm going to go to her. You see, that's what Israel was doing. And guys, you know you won't put up with that. And women, you won't either. You see, once we are betrothed, then our eyes are set on each other, not looking for other things. And what Israel was doing was they were looking at other men. And in some sense, we as the church are doing the same thing. Instead of keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're looking at the waves. They're carrying us away. We're looking at material things and trying to gain all that we can. And we're using excuses like, I don't want my children to suffer through what I went through. And we've made money and materialism our other God, our other boyfriend. Instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus, we do the same thing. And we've got to be careful with that. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. And so we've got to watch out for that. Two lords. And we're going to look at that later on what it means. See, that's, that's one of our biggest hangups and problems is we don't understand lordship and what that really means. But that's the center of covenant, really, is understanding lordship and the love that Jesus and God have for us. It's, it's, it's beautiful. We'll look at this. We'll look at that later after, after we finish Revelation. But once we are betrothed, we are to stay betrothed. Now, here's an example. In, now, that was Jeremiah 2 and Jeremiah 3. This is what God says in verse 8. And I saw for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. You don't get a writ of divorce unless you're betrothed slash married. And this is what God is saying. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. See, once Israel split into the two nations, you have the nation of Israel, which was 10 tribes, the nation of Judah, which was the two tribes. The nation of Israel never turned to God. The 10 tribes had 19 kings, and all of them did evil in the sight of the Lord and took the nation away. That's something to remember. We're, I'm going to come back to that point. Judah out of its, I think, 20 or 22 kings, eight or nine of them sought the Lord. And so Judah stayed a nation longer than Israel because of that. But at the end, I think they had four kings in a row that did evil in the sight of the Lord, and God said, I can't, I can't have it anymore. 
and Israel and Judah went off into exile into Babylon to come back again. But you see, God is doing this because he delights in us. He delights in us. Have you ever been to a carnival and seen and seen that little game where the little gophers or the chickens pop up and you stand there with a hammer waiting to whack them? A lot of us think that's what God is. We're the little chickens or the gophers popping up and he's waiting to whack us. And that is not what God is. <clears throat> Hear me. That is not what God is. Look at this. Let me, let, me, let me give you some scriptures. Psalm 16, verse 3. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is my delight. Do you ever think about that? God delights in you. You know, he even delights in you if you don't know him, if you've not accepted him, but he really delights in and gives favor to those that have accepted Jesus as Lord. But you are a delight. Psalm 22. Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let God deliver us. Let God rescue us. Because God delights in us. Now there are a lot of he's and him's there. I was just trying to, I was just trying to, Make it so it's understandable. It actually says, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Okay? God delights in you. That's what Psalm 22 says. God delights in you. Psalm 35. Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication and let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, who delights in the prosperity of his servants. Let me say, let me read that again. Let them shout for joy and rejoice, who favor my vindication and let them say continually, the, the, the Lord be magnified who delights in the prosperity of his servants. He delights in you being prosperous. Now, I'm not trying to preach, you know, uh, a prosperity doctrine or gospel, but that's what God said. He delights in the prosperity of his servants. Delights in our prosperity. See, he wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be on top, not on the bottom. He wants us to be whole, healed, walking in deliverance, free, rejoicing, so that the world will see and want it. That's part of how we are ambassadors. We're not ambassadors just by being subservient to everything. We're ambassadors by showing how great and awesome he is. You know, if we act just like the world, why would they want to be a part? They don't. And because we've acted wrongly and been haughty and put people down, there's a lot of people that don't want anything to do with the church. And I want you to know, as a pastor of the church of God, of God's church, I ask your forgiveness for those that have wronged you because it was bad. It was wrong. We don't, uh, we have not understood who we really are. And so I ask for your forgiveness as a representative of the church of God. He delights in you. See, and part of his word and part of his ways are us coming together. And so if you're one of those that have accepted Jesus and believe in him, but yet you're not going to church because the church has hurt you, 
You need to find one that will love you for who you are. Please don't continue. His word says that we are to stimulate one another to loving good deeds, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because as we come together, we use the giftings that God has given us to build each other up for the common good. And I'm missing what you have to give by your staying away. So I want to encourage you, come find a church, even if it's outside the denomination that you are used to. It doesn't matter. Find a church that will love you and that you can become a part of and become a member of and give. That's what church is about. Church is not about you coming and sitting in a pew and being dumped on. It's about you coming and giving. With that, let's take a break, and we'll be right back. 